there is a popular saying in leadership that if you think you are leading and there is nobody following you, you are only going on a walk. On this platform, you are going to learn principles of leadership. You are going to encounter different leaders. You are going to learn about how you can grow as a leader, how you can make an impact. My name is Samuel Ayim and I'm the host for the leadership platform. I am a leadership coach, a lawyer by profession, a John C. Maxwell certified coach. I have been in corporate life in senior positions for several years and now I run the Center for Transformational Leadership where we train and coach leaders to become better leaders. And I invite you to go on a journey with us as we discuss the subject of leadership in the coming weeks. This and every Saturday, you have opportunity to ask questions, share your views on important leadership matters. Hello, hello, good, good, good evening, everyone. Thank you, thank you for being on the leadership platform with us. My name is Samuel Ayim. I'm the CEO of the Center for Transformational Leadership in Africa, CTL Africa. This program is brought to you by CTL Africa every Saturday at 7 p.m. And we aim on this platform to share leadership ideas and to share principles. We bring you men and women who have led well, who have walked the journey and who have the experience to share with us. So we are privileged to have all of you. We value you, we value your time that you spend with us. It is a precious great gift that we do not take lightly. So thank you everybody who is connected. We see a number of people already connected on the platform. Please uh, let us know you are here by going to, the, to put your name and where you are joining from. We appreciate you so that we can welcome you properly. Uh, so as uh, more people join please just put your name and your where you are joining from into your comment session and we would pick it again as we go ahead the speaker is going to speak to us for between 30, 25 and 30 minutes or 35 minutes maximum and as um, he speaks we encourage you to put your learnings in the comment sessions, your comments on the list, on the on the comment sessions, please share your views. And if you have questions, also feel free to share your questions because at the end of the presentation, we will be taking your questions. Um, over the last several weeks, we have seen that a lot of lessons are learned during the Q and A. That is why we make the presentation short, and we give you a lot of time to be able to ask questions and specific questions, and then the questions are addressed to, to enable us to learn more. So we have 30 minutes of presentation, and we have about 40, 45 minutes of questions and answers and interactions and contributions. So I see um, Isaac, um Asian is on the line. Uh Steve of Sudankwa, I can see you. I see Jabate Dakun, you are very well welcome. Rans Philip is on the line and others are joining. So feel free to join. I see Nala Tilate. 
I see Frank ACN has joined and others who are online, please share your name and, and let's see and welcome you properly. Uh, this evening, we are going to discuss a very important subject. And um, the subject for this evening is on how to lift up others. Now, a lot of us, especially those of us in business uh, leadership, you know, our focus has been, you know, to make money and to, we, a lot of us are motivated by the money that we are getting, the outcome that we are getting, the results that we are coming, we are getting. But leadership, the essence of leadership is to lift up people, is to encourage and motivate people. If people are going to follow you, they are going to follow you because you are going to impact their lives positively. And so this evening, we are going to discuss on how to lift up people. And as we look for a speaker for this subject, um, we we've, we've think that uh, Fred Asari, who is going to speak to us, is the most able qualified person that we can see around. He's been leading for over 25 years or more. And the, his area of leadership is an area that a lot of us uh, probably would not go. Fred has dedicated his, his life to just serving people who are disadvantaged in society. Early in his life, Fred committed himself to serving um, people with hearing disability, the people we call deaf people. He learned sign language at age 15 or so, so that he can just minister, say the word of God with people who are, you know, left behind, people who need to hear the gospel, but most of us will not be able to reach out to them. Yes, we know that God is able to heal, but we also know that it is not everybody who is healed. And these guys needed to hear the word of God. Fred spent his time learning sign language and not only ministering to these people, but also trained several interpreters to be able to do that. When he finished his university with his uh, business administration in banking and finance, he decided that, look, he's not going to, uh, as he put it, waste his time in banking and working for money, but he was going to dedicate his time to lift our people. So he chose to work in an orphanage, an orphanage that basically did not exist, <laughs> okay? I mean, there, uh, I hope that he will share some of the stories with us. But he wanted to spend his time with people who are dis destitute, people who are disabled, who are left behind. And over the years, Fred has demonstrated how he can bring people from nowhere and bring them to the level. And what he has learned in this experience and how he has done it to bring the village of hope from nothing to now a huge institution, which is a group with several, you know, orphanages in, in, in Accra, supervising orphanages in the north. And recently they're receiving an orphanage in, in, in um, Central Africa that has called on village of hope to come and help to take care of some, some women and several other people. And the process built a school for orphans, not only from juniors, uh, from primary nursery through to secondary school, but he also has a technical training institute to take people off the street, off the street to train them. And this is huge. And these people off the street are able to make product. In fact, when we used to do Lift to Lead and we produce bags, all the bags that were shared at Lift to Lead conferences were produced by the children who have been taken off the street. Now with this experience, we believe Fred understands the principle that the highest purpose of leadership is to add value. And we want him to share with us how he has done this and what lessons we can take from him. So um, with those few words, um, we're gonna share with you a short video from um, one of Fred's projects. And then we would invite Fred Asari to come and talk to us. Fred is the group's chief executive officer 
of the Village of Hope Group. He will tell us more about that, hopefully, in his presentation. So uh, with, with those words, let us welcome Fred as we share uh, the uh, Hope College video. For the past eight years, Hope College, with its serene environment, coupled with excellent facilities and dedicated teachers, have churned out many successful graduates doing well in universities across Ghana and all over the world. Here are a few. My name is Regina Mensa Abusi, a fourth year medical student from the University of Cape Coast. I attended Hope College from the years 2013 to 2016. Hope College was a great preparatory stage for entering the world. It instilled in me virtues such as honesty and integrity, and that has brought me thus far. Choose Hope College. My name is Judith Edem Middleton Dugby, a second year medical student of the University of Cape Coast. I completed Hope College in the year 2019. At Hope College, quality driven education is assured, and the mind is educated as well as the heart. Choose Hope College. My name is Comfort Ajimandia, a level 200 law student at the University of Ghana. I completed Hope College in the year 2019, and my stay there was a wonderful experience. Apart from the fact that the environment is serene and very conducive for teaching and learning, the teachers are also highly experienced and display an unwavering dedication towards the student's body. This dedication is not limited to classroom activities only, but extends to the social, emotional and psychological life of the students through mentorship programs. The idea of schooling is not based on only academics, but includes the preparation of students for the battle ahead. In this vein, Hope College promises to equip each student to face the realities of life. Choose Hope College. The parents of our students, both past and present, are equally satisfied and proud. My name is Professor Kwejua Piedietia. I'm Assistant Professor of Law at the University of Ghana. I had the privilege of enrolling my son Yao at Hope College and I considered it a blessing because he came out as a well-rounded person in terms of his behavior, how to even do chores at home and the commitment to his studies. I chose Hope College because I believed in the principle of being raised in a close-knit Christian environment. But Christian ethics are used as a principle to discipline students and train them to become useful citizens for uh, Mother Ghana and of course for themselves as well. Yao embodied those qualities when he came out of Hope College. And so I consider it as one of the top-notch secondary schools in the country that people should be willing to enroll their students in. So choose Hope College. My name is Ms. Sarah Ansan, the headmistress of Sakumono Complex 2JHS. And my daughter is Ekia Ohiniwa Ansan, a second year student of the college reading general arts. I chose Hope College simply because in terms of academic excellence, I think Hope College is one of the best, if not the best, because they've not been in the system for quite a long time, but their track record is something that we can boast about. I will encourage every parent who wants their child to go to a private SHS and make it to choose Hope College. My name is Fred Asari. I am the founding headmaster of Hope College and currently the group managing director of Village of Hope. For character, scholarship, service and leadership, choose Hope College for the education of your child. Admission in progress locates Hope College in Gomwafete behind the Village of Hope campus. Visit www.vohgroup.org or call 020-023-7175. Zero two four eight seven four eight nine four four. Hope College, character, scholarship, service, leadership. All right, so Fred, you are very welcome to speak to us. Thank you, thank you very, very much. And good evening to everyone. Uh, perhaps this afternoon where you are, if you are not in Ghana, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be here with you 
and to share a few thoughts uh, with you on uh, lifting others through leadership. I want to share uh, my screen with you, and so bear with me for a few minutes, or maybe a few seconds, so I can share um, the screen. I'm not uh, very good in uh, these matters, so. <laughs> uh, All right, yeah. so you, 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 you go to the share screen, and then you share screen and you select application. So it will help you to share your screen with us. Yes. So click share screen, then you would click share screen again, and then you would have applications. Yes, now I can see it. Okay. You must have your PowerPoint Let's opened. Let's see if it will show up. Well, not yet. We are not seeing your screen yet. Yes, we can see it. Right. Wonderful. Okay, so we are ready to go then. I'm lifting others through leadership. Once again, it's an honor and a privilege uh, to be invited to share a few thoughts um, with, with you. To begin with, I want to make a few things clear. Uh, for those of us who have been part of the leadership platform for a while now, I think it is no news to you uh, to know that leadership is influence. There are several hundred definitions of leadership. But the bottom line, what we believe in is that leadership is influence. If you're a leader, you should be able to influence um, people that you lead. And so that is what we must understand uh, basic for our nation for, for leadership. Don Sim as well has said, and I've repeated it over and over again, uh, especially to the staff of Village of Hope. You know, that's one of my favorite quotations. Everything rises and falls on leadership. There is no exception. Everything rises and falls on leadership. So the state of our institutions, the state of our organizations, the state of our nations, all these things, the state of our families, even our own personal state, all that is a result of leadership or the lack of leadership. And so when we are talking about leadership, it's important that we understand that it is crucial that in every aspect of life, whether it's your own personal life, your family life, your career life, or your social life, in every aspect, leadership is crucial. And we are who we are as a result of leadership. And our societies and communities are where they are as a result of leadership. I had this statement um, some time ago, leadership is caused this effects. I don't know who first said it, and so I've not attributed it to anyone. But it is very true. It is leadership that causes things to happen. And what we see around us, the good, the bad, the ugly, all that is a result of leadership. So that is what we want to set the foundation um, of our discussion with as we talk about you know, um, lifting others through leadership. And so let me begin by saying that most of the things I'm going to say or share with you are based on my personal experience through the years. Uh, I have been involved in leading the village for over the past 25 years. I'm coming up to 26 very soon. And so uh, by the grace of God, I've been able to gather some experiences and I want to share these experiences with you in relation to our topic of uh, lifting others up through leadership. In so doing, I'll be quoting a lot from uh, John Maxwell and then a few other people as well. Um, and I'll be sharing principles that you can apply. The, the, the hope is that you apply these principles wherever you are. I mean, there are very few people in the nonprofit world and even fewer still in caring for orphans, orphans and destitute children. And so the idea is that whatever we discuss, you can get some principles that can apply to you, whether in the financial sector, or you are in the educational uh, sector, or you are in politics, or you know a traditional ruler, wherever you are, principles can be applied 
uh, to your specific situations. And so uh, that is a hope. And owing to time constraints, uh, I'm given only 30 minutes. I like to talk. Those who know me know I like to talk a lot. So I would try and limit myself to 30 minutes. I will not even be bothered by the extra, perhaps five minutes. I will just try and stick so we have more interaction in the Q&A session. So forgive me if, or pardon me if I'm going too fast, but we have a lot to cover in less than 30 minutes. So because most of the things I'm going to talk about uh, would come from my personal experiences, I just wanted to uh, share a few uh, minutes, I'll spend a few minutes to share with you um, my story. Um, I was 14 years in 1984, uh, in, in Kumase when I met an American preacher. And this American could communicate with the deaf. Today, there is this funny statement, quite a wow. You know, there's quite a shock and there's quite a wow. Uh, it, it, it's, it's very interesting and funny to me. Uh, but I was, I was surprised to see a man who could communicate with deaf people. It, it just amazed me. Just by throwing his hands all over the place, the deaf understood him, he understood them, they laughed and they, they shared life together. And I wanted to learn the sign language, so I approached uh, this man. In 84, he, we became friends, he went back to the United States, but he came back in 1985 to organize a sign language interpreters uh, workshop. And I attended, and that's how I learned um, sign language. And then, Four years uh, down the line in 1989, uh, during my first year um, at the University of Ghana, I moved from Kumasi to live, of course, on the University of Ghana campus, Lagos. And whilst I was there, I started the ministry to the deaf. Because what surprised me was that deaf people had been completely neglected. Nobody was interested in them. I, I didn't see any church that was interested in in sharing the gospel with, with deaf people. I didn't see any organizations, institutions that were interested in them. And I had learned the sign language and it bothered me that a significant population, uh, you know, of the populace of Ghana, a significant part of our people were completely neglected. And so I, as a university student, I ventured out. On days I didn't have lectures, I would go into the city of Accra, I would look for deaf people, uh, I found them where they were working. I'll visit with them and invited them to uh, come fellowship, um, you know, at the Church of Christ. And they would come, and that's how we got started. Throughout my university education, um, I was working with deaf people. And then in 1992, by the time I graduated from the University of Ghana, the church had grown to 60 deaf people. And uh, we are started, uh, I realized that the only way forward was to train more people to help because I was not always available. And so I needed to train interpreters so that they could help these deaf people, which is uh, what brought about the um, sign language interpretation interpreters class. And then because there were people who could interpret for them, I was free to go across the country at, uh, uh, at different places and find deaf people, Swedro, Mampong, and uh, Takradi Kumase, all over the place, uh, you know, and minister to them. And so that's how I got involved in, in trying to lift people up. Because sometimes I'll be in the university and then um, deaf people will come to me. Uh, even in, in my hall of residence, uh, somebody has been arrested by the police and uh, he's been accused of stealing just because he was found walking about and when people tried to talk to him, uh, he couldn't respond. So they mistook him for a thief and beat him up and send him to the police station. And the police cannot take a statement. And so I'm called from the university and I have to go to the uh, Kanishi police station or whatever police station and, and try to interpret. And, and then the police will realize, oh, this is a deaf man who is not a thief, you know? And so I, I began the, the long journey of trying to help lift people up, trying to help people understand deaf people. Then in 1994, I was invited by the leadership of the Church of Christ uh, to lead an offering. Um, so November 19, December 94, uh, we registered Village of Hope and um, we began preparatory works to start uh, caring for children. And then by 
96, we started with eight children, a married couple of house parents, and then uh, one security man and myself. In 97, that was a shock of my life. I got a call from the district chief executive of, uh, I think it's Fantiapa district, that there was a child in Begro um, who needed help. So I drove to Begro to see the child. When I got there, I found this four-year-old child called Vera who was naked. I'm talking about naked, completely naked, not even under. And nobody cared about this girl. And so uh, we took that girl, brought the girl to the village of Hope. Uh, this girl has completed a uh, university now. Uh, she did her national service in Parliament House, and now she's working. Um, but but um, that is how we started reaching out and helping more children. But then there was another story at Ejumakun in the central region where uh, parents had died, leaving behind, um, I think, five children. And I want to help these children. And we got to Ejumako, and by the rules of the social welfare, they had to complete forms, and we had to do social investigation report and get a care order and all that before we could move the children to the orphanage. Well, by the time we were ready to move the children, a two-year-old girl had died, not out of malaria, not out of any sickness. She had died out of hunger and shocked me to the bone. I thought that people in Ethiopia and other places died out of hunger. But right here in Ghana, a child had died out of hunger. And then I made a pledge to God. I will never say no to a destitute child. If it means I should, I will break the law to save a life, I will do so. I say it without any apology. If I'm going to do anything to save a human life, I will do it. And because of that village hope, grew significantly and now we have a training center for teenagers on the streets and then we have two elementary schools Hope Christian Academy and Hope Christian School. We have a fully fledged hospital, uh, three doctors um, with a, a, um, a pharmacy, a dental facility, an eye clinic and all that. And then there is Hope College which is a senior high school um, and then um, just this year, just this year, we have um, taken over a children's home in Bongo, in the East region, um, that really needed help. And so that's the, that has come. And all this, whether it is caring for the sick, or it is educating children, or it is training teenagers of, of, of this, on the streets, or taking them off the street, or it's helping orphan, abandoned, destitute, and even children who have been rescued from slavery, children on the water lake in Kitakrati and surrounding villages who are in, involved in slavery. And we rescue them and help them. And in all this, the goal is to lift them up, lift up the sick, lift up the, the student, lift up the orphan. That has been my experience over the last 25 years. And so I want to share with you some of the things that you, we can do, all of us can do, um, and help us all to focus on lifting others up. Principle number one I'll share with you is determine your mission with conviction. Why do you want to do what you're doing? In French, it's called a raison d'etre. I'm not a very good uh, French speaker, so forgive me if I pronounce it wrongly. But that simply means reason for being, reason for existence. Before you decide to lift somebody up, ask yourself the question, why am I doing it? What do I want to do? What is the most important reason or purpose for my wanting to lift somebody up? It, it, this is very important because if you don't get this right, you may get a whole lot of things wrong. You know, persons, some people have come to me and then they tell me, well, I, I've just been declared redundant at my workplace and right now I have no work to do, so I want you to help me so that I can set up an NGO. You know, somebody comes and says, I've been looking for a job. I, I can't find a job, so uh, I want to set up an orphanage. I said, just because you are looking for a job, that is the wrong reason to set up an orphanage. Because in such a case, such a person is only seeking to lift himself up. He's not seeking to lift anybody up. He wants a job. He wants to make, uh, to make ends meet, 
And so he's going to do it. It is important that we ask ourselves before we go into any venture, what's our mission? Why are we doing this? What do we seek to accomplish? That is very important. And you must be convinced of it. Because lifting people up is not easy. Lifting people up is difficult work. And if you are not convinced of why you are doing it, you stop along the way or you will miss the way completely. And you end up hurting people instead of helping people. So before you lift somebody up, ask yourself, why? Write down your mission. What is the reason for doing what you're doing? Are you convinced of it? Or you just want to do it anyhow? That is very important. That we must remember. Help you to lift others up. We also must set our vision. And I say with a shining flag. A vision is where you want to be. A vision is where you want to go. Where do you want to go? What is the end you seek to accomplish? Before you lift somebody, ask yourself, where am I lifting that person to? This is very important. You know, when soldiers fight and they take a territory, they usually look for the highest point and then they put their flag, the flag of the nation they represent, to say that this nation has taken over this land. That then is their vision for the fight. They were fighting to take over the land and they put a flag there. When you have to let people, what is your end goal? It must be not just anything, it must be a shining flag. It must be something bright, something excellent. Where do you want to get to? We seek the highest standards of excellence and we must abhor mediocrity. Because if you don't do that, you are not really going to lift people up or you're going to lift them up into a more deplorable state or an unacceptable state. And so, in setting your vision, let us be committed to excellence. Excellence. People have come to the village of hope and they've talked about, ah, and this place is too nice. Hey, orphans, and uh, they, they have such nice, nice beds, you know, and they are surprised. I said, what did you expect? You expect them to sleep on, a, on the floor? You expected a, a dirty place with, with dirty walls? No, you're not going to get that. Our vision is to take orphans and abandoned and destitute children and give them the best care, the best care possible. And I tell people, if you were to die, and your child would go to an orphanage or a children's home, what kind of care would you want your child to receive? If you want your child to receive the best kind of care, that is what we are going to give to our children. You know, you go to a place and the place is dirty and so, well, these poor people, it's okay. It's not okay. Mediocrity is never okay. We must do things well with excellence and we must confront negative and unacceptable behavior. When people are doing things that are not right, are not up to acceptable standard, we must be able to say so. If people are feeding people on the streets with bad food, we, we should be able to stop that. If you're going to feed them, feed them well. If you're going to lift somebody up, lift that person up well. So, as a point of view, when we were buying beds, so I went to the little food. And I asked for the different types of mattresses. They said, well, there's two inches thick, there's four inches thick, there's six inches thick. And then uh, sometimes people order eight inches. I want the eight inches. And they went, why do you want that? I said, I'm buying it. First. And they were sure. Yes, I wanted to buy the best mattress for them so they can sleep comfortably. That should be our goal. When we strive for excellence, when you strive for excellence, you prompt your people to shoot for the top. That's a quotation from John C. Maxwell. And Vince Lombardi says, the quality of a person's life is in direct proportion to their commitment to excellence, regardless of their chosen field of excellence. So whatever we are doing, leading people at the bank, leading people at the marketplace, leading people in parliament, leading people at the chief's palace, leading people anywhere, we must strive for excellence. We must also gather a team. You can't do it alone. No matter who you are, you are not Superman, you are not Superwoman. You can't do it alone. 
The work that needs to be done. There are so many people down, so many of them, that you alone cannot lift them all up. That is where you need a team. You need a team to help you lift other people up. And you must gather your team with pre precision. You don't gather people just because they have come. Ask yourself, do they share in your mission? The team you are putting together to lift people up. The team you are putting together to, to, to do what you're doing, whether it's to set up a, a, a communication business or to uh, you know set up a, a manufacturing business or to help people, do they share your vision? Do they have what it takes to reach the vision? It's important that we answer these questions. And if the people don't share your vision, your mission, and if they don't have what it takes to reach the vision, then it is obvious that it is obvious that they will not be good people helping you to um, reach your vision. So I'm told that my internet connection is not very good. So uh, I think we are trying to move it so that we can get a, a better connection. But I'll go on whilst we try to do that. Uh, I'll go on so we try to, to do that. I hope uh, at least we haven't, haven't wasted your time and you, you have heard what I said. Number four, when attempting to lift up people, unleash your actions with passion. Unleash your actions with passion. You have to model what you want others to be. If you want parents to take good care of children, you must be the first person to take good care of the children. If you want people to be people of integrity, you must be the first person to be a person of integrity. And your passion must show in what you do. Your passion must show in what you do. So that people will see that that is what you stand for. If you're a leader and people don't know what you stand for, then people should be able to know what you stand for. So they should be able to say, if the leader is here, he wouldn't stand for this. If the leader is here, she wouldn't accept this quality. Because they know you and you do your things with passion. Dr um, the year of Chicago did a five-year study to find out what were the things that helped extraordinarily successful people to be successful. And after seen thousands of people for five years, their result was this. The study found out that drive, determination, and desire, not natural talent, lead to extraordinary success of extraordinarily successful individuals. It is drive determination, desire. These are the things that lead to success. And John Maxwell said, the starting point of all achievement is drive, determination, and desire. It's not talent. You may have a gift for something, but if you don't have passion for that thing, you don't get the best out of it. I use myself as an example because that's the best I can give. I didn't study social work. Never study social work at the university or anywhere else. But here I am, leading perhaps one of the biggest children's homes or orphanages in Ghana. And I believe Billy Hope is doing very well in that regard. Question is, how did it happen? It is passion. It is not my technical or academic knowledge. And that is not to say that technical skills are not important. That is not to say that academic knowledge is not important, achievement is not important. But that is to say, in addition to technical knowledge, in addition to academic achievement, you need passion. You need drive, determination, and desire to do what you need to do. If you have the technical skills, but have no passion, you will not achieve much. And you will not be able to lift others up. Because you, you have nothing to motivate them to even follow you. So it is important that we understand this very well. We also have to surround our identity with integrity. Surround your identity with integrity. You see, nonprofit work depends on the goodwill of others. Lifting people 
many a time depend on goodwill. And you will not get that goodwill if you lack integrity. If you go into a field, work of life, just for what you will get out of it, you will fail miserably. That is why integrity is of utmost importance. If you are a pastor and you start a church, and all interested in is the collection and the money you get and the fame, and you lack integrity, eventually things will get will catch up with you. And eventually, people will see through your lack of integrity and you will lose face. If you set out to help people and you lack integrity, it will eventually show up and it hurts that cause. So whatever it is that you are doing, you need integrity. And it must be synonymous with your identity. Character of paramount importance. And your master says, the success of an organization will not, uh, of an organization will not reach beyond the character of its leaders. No organization will reach beyond the character of its leaders. If the leaders are crook, crooked people, the organization will end up being crooked. If leaders lack integrity, the organization will end up be, being an organization that lacks integrity. It is of crucial importance that we become people of integrity. If you are genuinely committed to lift people, you shouldn't be concerned about being in charge of everything. I have to say, especially when it comes to money. The leader is not the person who must sign every check. Once you have systems in place, once you have uh, systems and procedures in place, people should be able to do their work and everything should be overboard. You don't go and put your hand in the, into the kitty and take money and say, oh, our country, that is a lack of integrity. And it will bring the organization down and you will end up not being able to lift up people. And so, one thing that has really helped with nonprofits that have succeeded is that of integrity. When they lose integrity, then everything is lost. So, that is where we have a problem integrity. It is important that we do that. Number six, I would say, surround, surrender your activities to accountability. It's linked up with integrity. People who lack accountability don't go very far and they don't lift people up very high. You should be accountable to a select group of trusted people who are not afraid to call you to order or discipline. You know, people will start a football team and they gather people's children and say, coach football. And they don't have anybody to whom they are accountable. But here you are guiding people's children to train them how to play football. Here you are traveling with other people's children from town to town to play football. And there's nobody checking on you. How can we be sure that you're doing this in the best interest of the children? It's therefore important that we take corporate governance seriously. Whether it's in the profit-making business or in the non-profit world, Corporate governance and structural issues are of key importance. It is important that we do not squander the trust and the confidence that people have reposed in us. So it is important that you put in place systems and procedures for effective checks and balances. That you started an organization doesn't mean you should be the one holding the checkbook. You should be the only signatory to the account. You and your wife are the only signatories. It doesn't work that way. Yet you might have been the person who started it. But you need to be accountable to somebody. It's important that you get the bonus. It's important that you get a group of people who are not sycophants, not people who just sing your praises, but people who can call you to order. People People who can discipline you if need be, so that you will always be careful. Other than that, you will slip and the fall will be huge. 
and the impact will not be just on your organization it will affect all other organizations trying to lift people up and that's why it's important that people must find accountability partners you must have somebody that you can confide in you must have somebody who can come to you and ask you direct questions have you spent more money beyond your salary this month where did you get that money from if you don't have somebody who can ask you these questions then you are working alone and it's dangerous because you can easily fall and so accountability is of uh, great importance you also have to listen to your stakeholders with attention you see no matter how good you are you can't see everything you can't hear everything you can't feel everything and you definitely cannot know everything that's why stakeholders are important stakeholders see hear feel taste and know more than you do so when you want to have, for example kai at mokala market or mala market how do you help the kai you have to listen to them they are your clients they are the reason for you going there you want to lift them up but these people may be poor but it doesn't mean they, are, they lack intelligence they may be poor but it doesn't mean that they don't have self-respect you must hear their side you must listen to their concerns it's not that i'm here to help you and here i'm giving you my house no you must listen to your donors it's, it's, your money alone can go where you know cannot go far you need other people listen to them you must listen to your staff you must listen to people in your leadership your place in leadership you must listen to your board of governors your board of directors your council whatever your institution is it's important that leaders to listen otherwise you'll be lifting up people who don't need to be lifted up you lift up people who don't need your kind of help and you will be thinking you are helping them but in natural fact you may be harming them so let's learn to listen. Let's learn to listen to people. It is very important. The fact that you are helping an orphan child doesn't mean the orphan has not, has not got a say. It is the orphan you are helping. So listen to that person. And sometimes when you are lifting somebody up and the person says, bring me out. Listen to the person. Don't think you know you must motivate your clients the people you desire to help motivate them with desire to be desire to be is let the people have a desire to be lifted up you see if you're a teacher you cannot help a student achieve beyond what the student wants desires to be if you want your student to write an exam and get a a um, a1 and your student has no desire for A1. You may be the best teacher in the world. You can't lift up that student. So first, let the student desire to have A1. Let the orphan desire to go on in life, to go to university. Create a desire in people. How do you do that? One, you must value people. If you think you're helping people so you can just treat them anyhow, you are making a mistake. You respond to people according to how you view them. And there is a direct correlation between the value you place on people and the treatment you give to people. So it's not just about you are the savior and you are coming to help them. It's about treating people with respect, treating them with value, listening to them, creating them a desire for change, a desire to go up. Then you motivate people. All growth begins with motivation. And so the master has three questions that to help us motivate people. What the people want? Now we know what you want. But is that what the people want? Do they have a way of getting what they want? And will they be rewarded if they are successful? Some years ago, we wanted to motivate the children in the orphanage to read. And we did all we could. They were just not interested in reading. So we instituted program if you are able to read 10 books you get a book for free and now because the children wanted their own books they started reading and we gave them the books and the person who was able to read 
100 books was taken to Accra to a fancy restaurant. And we took pictures. And other children saw it. It's like, wow, I also want to go and eat in a restaurant in Accra. So, hey, you can go to Accra and eat in a nice restaurant, but you have to read 100 books. And we have to certify that you've indeed read the books. When we did that, many children started reading, and it improved their academic performance because they knew after every 10 books, they will get their own book. And after 100 books, they will get to eat in a restaurant. That's how you motivate people. Let them know that if they saw it, they'll be rewarded. Let the person you are trying to help know that there is reward at the end. And that would help. My time is almost up. So I'll say two more, uh, go to two more principles. Grow your team through development. Develop yourself and then develop others. You, you cannot lift up people when you yourself you are weak. When you are weak, you are sick. And then somebody comes that you should lift up. When you yourself, you cannot lift yourself off the bed. How do you do that? It is important that you develop yourself so you can develop others. An insecure person cannot lift others up. And it is when you develop yourself that you gain confidence to lift people up. Many people in organizations are not able to lift others up because they're insecure. What if they come and get my job? What if they, they, they come and, and, and kick me out? That is insecurity. You cannot lift others up when you are insecure. And so the first thing, your first duty to yourself is to lift yourself up. And then you can develop others, develop your team. So I know my time is up. Give me two minutes to, to, to summarize, uh, to, to wrap up, to wrap up rather. There is an account proverb that says that if you are cutting a walking stick, don't cut a walking stick or don't make a walking stick that is taller than you. That is a very wrong notion in leadership, that you don't want to lift somebody be above you. If you have lifted them up and they get above you, get higher than you, they will be a blessing to you. So you need to develop your team so that you, they can help lighten your load of leadership, they can make the organization grow, and you can accomplish more. Finally, fortify your heart against failure. Everyone will fail one way or the other. It will happen. Sometimes you cannot lift everybody up. Don't be discouraged. That you try to lift somebody up, you couldn't do it, so you are discouraged. Don't be discouraged. Lift as many as you can, but don't think you can lift up everybody. And then some people will speak lies about you. People you are happy. Let me you to stop. Some people will be very ungrateful to you. After you've lifted them up, they don't care about you any longer. But that shouldn't stop you. So let us understand that the growth and development of people is the highest calling of leadership. If you are working in the police service, if you are working as a parliamentarian, if you are working in government, if you are working in a bank or an insurance company, if you are working in a manufacturing company, if you are leading people on the football field or in academia, wherever you are, the growth and development of people is the highest calling of leadership. And John Maxwell says, all of the certificates of recognition we read in life will fade, and the monuments we build will crumble, the trophies we gain will corrode, but what we do for others will make a lasting impact on our world. So please, lift up some people in this life. Don't go through life and come to the end of your life and you cannot number and name the people you've lifted up. Lift some people up and begin now. Thank you very, very much. So I will hand over to Mr. Samuel Ayim. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Thank you so very much. Um, yes, we have a number of positive comments coming through. Uh, we understand that you are joining us from far away from the village in Fugomuafete, and therefore the internet is not very, very good, but we managed to understand everything that you said and great, great lessons there. So let me just take a few of the comments that are coming through. Um, you know, um, well, some people say, 
Uh, I'm excited to be part of this program. Uh, Juliana, listening from the United States. Um, Douglas, I'm watching. This program is indeed challenging and challenging my leadership style. Uh, several people on board. Um, we, uh, Christiana Aguino said this is awesome. And Victoria uh, to force is very proud of you listening to you. I strongly believe it is a complete calling. We are able to sign to the deaf because of your impact. God richly bless you. So uh, Collison says splendid, sir. Um, Eunice Mesa, I almost missed. Um, well, you are on board, so thank God. Uh, now Latilate says lifting up is a divine calling. Leadership can be a tool or vehicle through which it can be achieved. Leadership should continue building social system to enhance this. Uh, Edwin asks, say leadership is a tool of development. And so there's so many. Uh, Michael Annan says, thank you, Mr. Asari, indeed. I'm a beneficiary of your leadership of lifting others up. Keep on the good work. Thank you, CTL, for the opportunity. And um, more. If you can read, you can lead. Well, you have to note that and see if you can read, you can read. Read to lead. Very interesting. Cynthia Martinson says, kudos, Fred. I'm proud. We are proud of you. David Adai says, this is more deeper than a, an academic lecture. Very, very equipping, grateful. Um, well done, CTL, for this educative and motivating platform uh, from Victoria to Four. Ajoa Sapon says, very educative. Daniel Ajela B says, thanks a lot. Great insight. Alex Piazan says, thank you, boss. Uh, he says, thank you, boss. We appreciate your leadership. That must be one of your, your team members uh, congratulating you there. Thank you so much, Mr. Sare, for the impact. We are grateful. Um, now, Ben asked a question. Does lifting others, others up mean one should not be ego, egotistical? Uh, does lifting up what? How does it mean that one should not be egotistical? That's the question. Um, I believe you understand. Thank you very much. Inspiring lessons. Great presentation, uh, Lord for Joseph. Thank you for inspiring me the more. Dograsam Whiting, sharing vision and self-discipline is my key to leadership. Tete Jr. says, power-packed experience. Um, you just started. Thank you for sharing. Great presentation, Nana Abano. So those are some of the positive comments. Guys, now let your questions flow. Fred is ready to answer any question. So this, listening up others means you should not take care of yourself. Fred. That's a question. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for that uh, question. It's a good question. <laughs> It doesn't mean that. I think I said that to be able to take care of others, you must take care of yourself. You see, the idea of lifting connotes the idea of somebody with strength. If you don't have strength, you can't lift somebody up. So for starters, you must be strong. And that's where developing yourself comes in. That is where taking care of yourself comes in. When you are strong, it gives you confidence to lift others up. So it's important that we develop ourselves so that we will get the strength to lift others up. And so that is what it's all about. It's not just about yourself. You're not getting the strength just for yourself, just for your ego. You are getting the strength so you can serve, so you can lift people up. Because at the end of the day, if you have all the money, you have all everything else, but you never were a blessing to somebody never lift up anybody else. At the end of your life, you feel very lonely and not accomplished. You know, so it's important that you help others 
And to be able to do so, take good care of yourself first. And it's not about you, it's about other people as well. Not you alone, the others as well. I hope this answer has been helpful. Thank you so much, uh, that's helpful. You cannot give what you don't have, so you have to invest in yourself, add value to yourself so you can value, you can add value to others. Now, um, Fred, uh, there's a, a question from Douglas, um, Douglas Amwate. Uh, what do you do if people you want to lift up do not understand you and your vision? You want to lift up people, but they do not understand you on, and your vision. So note that. And then second question, how to how to lead people who are ahead of you in terms of skills after being given opportunity uh, after being given opportunity in the company so how do you lead people uh, who are ahead of you after you've been given the opportunity in the organization all right so those are two questions i want you to take them before we go on uh, please continue to put your questions in the box and fred would answer them yes all right, thank you very much. So I mentioned the importance of motivation. You have to let people know why you want to help them. You want to, you want to give them a vision of the end. That is how you can let them understand you, though they will understand you are trying to help. You know? So you have to be able to give people a picture of the end you know the, there's a bible story um for those of you who read the bible there's a bible story of uh, moses leading the israelites out of egypt the Israelites have been in egypt at least for those people their whole lives their grandparents were there their parents were there and they were there how do they move out of egypt it, moses had to paint a picture that i am taking you to a land filled with milk and honey. So when the people are motivated, that is what we want to know. The leader must paint a picture. That is what I call a shining flag. Not just a flag. A shining flag. Show them where they want to go. I remember when we started building the group, we had a, a, a small bus. And one day I just gathered the children, drove them to the University of Ghana. And I just drove around the campus. This is Water Hall, this is Kwaku Hall, this is Lego Hall, this is the uh, Commonwealth Hall. Then we went up to the Great Hall, you know, of, of Legon, on, on top of the hill, so they could see a crack. And, and, and then just so they would aspire to go to university. Because these are all whose grandparents and parents have never even gone to secondary school. And you want them to go to university. Why should they go to university? Does it matter? You must show them a shining flag on top of the hill. So they will go up there and get it. And so that is how you will let people understand that you want to help them. That is how you do it. Paint to them a vision, a picture of where you are taking them. Then leading people who have more skills than you. Well, that is where leadership comes in. Or lifting those people up. You see, they may have more technical skills. It doesn't mean that they are leaders. And so, the way to work with them, with the team, is what brings about success. We want to, we want to keep up through education. I didn't do education. I didn't study education. I don't have a postgraduate diploma in education. But we started a senior high school. What do we do? We have to find the people with the academic qualification to teach, people who have done education to be able to do that. We run a hospital. I've never been to medical school. You know, the closest I've been to a medical school is to see the buildings of the medical school at Kulibu. That's the closest I've been to medical school, seeing the buildings. But we wanted to help the village people, provide them with excellent health care. And so we had to look for the people with the technical skills, the doctors, the nurses, the lab technologists, you know, the pharmacists, the optometrists, and all those people. So a leader should be able to 
clearly define his or her mission, should be able to point the vision and be able to attract people to them. And when you do that, you will get the right people to come. And if you are at the workplace and you've been promoted above technical people, you should be able to still point a vision to them of where you are taking the organization. And let them know that when they get there, when we get there together, they will also benefit. They will also be blessed by them. When you do that, they will join you to get there. So it is important that you cast a vision that is powerful, that is attractive, that can draw people with the technical skills to follow you. But people will ask you, what is in it for me? And that is why it's important that you let them understand that we win together. When we get to that hill, when we get to that land filled of flowing milk and honey, we will win together. Then they'll be ready to join you to get there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Fred, for those uh, responses. Very interesting. I would like you to tell us, I mean, Village of Hope, um, to share with us, you know, some of the, some of your products, some of your children that you have grown, who are orphans that you have brought up. Um, do you have some numbers? Do you have some names, some people who have left the Village of Hope and what they are doing? If you can share a few examples with us, that would be very great. But uh, well, Margaret, thank says, you. Margaret says, uh, I love the practical examples, splendid presentation, I've learned a lot. Uh, Periophory says, great presentation, thanks so much. Ebenezer, well done, my headmaster, for sharing such thoughtful, provo thought-provoking experiences. Thank you. Uh, so that is uh, from, uh, from Ebenezer. Rebecca, thank you. I want him to throw more light on how to help people to uh, to to desire to be lifted. So somebody, uh, Rebecca Owusu, I want you to throw more light on how to help people to have the desire to be lifted up. So if you can answer those, those ones, we have quite a few more comments coming up. All right, thank you. Well, I'll say over the last uh, 25 years, a more than 100 have graduated from the village of um, who are uh, all over the country. We have uh, uh, an immigration officer. Uh, we have several teachers. Oh, several teachers. Um, we have uh, also several nurses who have completed uh, nursing training course and, uh, and are nurses in our hospitals in Ghana. Uh, uh, actually, he's even now a lecturer at the uh, uh, School of Medical Sciences at uh, KNUST. Uh, he's also a consultant uh, with the Confrontation Teaching Hospital um, in, in Kumasi. He's a dentist and uh, uh, he has a, a big title, Mazu something something, you know, title. He's just a big guy. Um, we have a lawyer um, who is also doubling in politics, a human rights lawyer, um, who has got, come out of the village of Hope. We have uh, agriculturists. Um, th there are many, many, many people you know, from the medical field, uh, from security agencies, we have military officers uh, who have gone through the village of hope, uh, and then teachers and nurses and, and you know, people in all uh, different kinds of uh, fields. Uh, bankers, yes, I forgot to mention that. We have bankers, we have uh, accountants. Um, so there are many, uh, there are many. Over 100, 100 people have gone through, you know, uh, the village of hope. And these are people who have just graduated uh, you know, from tertiary institutions. Then we have over 500 street teachers. And right now, uh, tailors, teachers, hairdressers, and hairdressers. You know, Unfortunately, your, your internet is a bit scratchy. So some of oh. the numbers are missing, but um, we we are struggling to hear. We know you are in the village, so no problem. Continue yeah. to. Oh, okay, so, yeah. so we have 500 teenagers who have been moved off the streets completely. They've been given skills, they've been given tools, and they are now working independently. They are productive members of society. They are no longer on the streets. 
you know. And, um, and there were those who have also gone to various training institutions um, who are out there um, in society. All right. How do you help people to desire to be lifted? Uh, somebody asked the question. How yeah. do you help people to desire to be lifted? You have to give them a reason why they should be lifted. I am lying down here. I've given up a life. Why do you want me to get up? You must give me a compelling reason. And the reason must be beneficial to me, be convincing to me. It's not about you. It's about me, the one lying down there. And so that's what you need to do. You know, there are street girls that we've taken off the streets. We brought to a vocational school and we are training them. Sometimes a girl will tell you, uh, you are, I can't stay here. I want my freedom. I want to go back on the streets. But you are going to sleep uh, in the ghettos. You are going to beat them with mosquitoes. You are going to do this. You say, yeah, yeah, yeah. They are used to that life. So you must convince them why they shouldn't go back to the streets. Okay. I girl, you know, one day said that uh, she may have this, this is a girl, a girl, okay, 15 year old girl. She's been having sex on the streets since maybe she was 12 years old. And now she's 15 years, she stayed on the street for so long. We moved her to a vocational school. We are training her in skills. And she says, uh, I, I want to have sex. Here, you don't let me have sex. I want to go back to the streets. You know, I want to be a prostitute. I want to go back. Then you have to give such a girl a reason why she should not go back to the streets. And so the leader must find out what does the person want? What does the person want in life? Can you paint a picture that is so nice for the person? Can you show the person an example of what you want the person to be? Okay, so if you know of a street person who has become successful, invite the person or take this street girl to that street woman, that woman who is now independent. Working. Take the girl to her office and she'll see this woman. This woman will talk to her and say, Wow, you mean you were living on the streets? And today you have an air-conditioned office. Oh, okay. I want to be like that. You know, so the leader must find convincing reasons why a person who is lying down there must get up and rise up. You know, somebody comes to the workplace. He came with a B BC as a laborer. And he's been a laborer for 10 years. And uh, that's all he knows. You must give this person a compelling reason why he must go and learn, do classes, you know, um, after work classes and learn and go and write the WASI as a private candidate. You know, that you cannot be a laborer forever. You have to rise up. And you can, this is what you have, you have to do. You know, very soon you grow weak. You cannot be reading. You also need work that is not physically taxing. So develop a reasonable person. That's the key. That's key. All right. Thank you so much, Fred. Um, I can see so many questions. So if your answers will be short, we'll be able to answer more. Otherwise, okay. we can lose some of them out. And we don't okay. like to leave any question out. Um, I'll give short answers. <laughs> so, um, uh, somebody asked the question, Mr. Asari, were there times that you really wanted to quit? What is the most challenging aspect of this journey and how do you sustain and keep your focus? So note that. Um, second question from Victoria to four, please, as a leader, at what point can you say no to assisting others when you feel so stressed uh, without uh, feeling bad, you know? So I think those two questions are related. At what point do you say no to assisting others? Uh, because you, you yourself, you feel so stressed. Uh, maybe I should add one more and if you can answer them. Uh, people in our part of the world value money over principles and concepts, which can, which when applied can lift them up what do you suggest can be done in such situation? People in our part of the world uh, value money over principles 
um, concept which when applied can lift them up? What do you suggest? So those are three questions uh, for you, uh, Fred. Um, your internet is not very good, but uh, um, so we'll manage with it. Okay, um, uh, thank you. Um, I think I said from the very beginning that it is important that we have um, we have confidence. You know, you have to be convinced of your mission. It is very important because you can easily get discouraged, and there's so many things happening that will discourage you. And so, it is when you are convinced that this is my mission, this is my reason for being, this is my reason for existence. That is when you will be able to survive the onslaught of discouragement. You know, so it is important that uh, we do that. And then um, challenging times. You know, there are many challenging times, many. But you see, for example, you have a child, and then the child grows up, the child becomes independent. Now the child doesn't even want to be associated with uh, village hope. You know, the child feels ashamed. Well, it's human nature. Some people do that, you know. So, for example, you take an orphan who was maybe four years old, help the orphan through education, primary, JHS, senior high school. The orphan goes to the university. You pay for full university, you know, room and board, uh, you know, hostel and uh, fees, everything. You even give money, you buy a laptop for the kid, you do everything. Then on graduation day, you go to the graduation and then the child feels ashamed to be associated with an orphanage. She doesn't want her university colleagues to know that she was taken care of by an orphanage. So at the graduation ceremony, you are looking for your child. Your child is nowhere to be found. Why? Because she feels ashamed to be associated with the very orphanage that took care of him or her. What do you do? It's part of life. You know, that's what I'm saying. Prepare your heart. For you just play that. When you say no to assisting us, but if you when it is when you realize that the help is not helping the person, okay, you don't want to throw away help. So if you are helping somebody, you've done all you can to explain to the person, convince the person that he or she needs help. But the person this reasons, you know, at that stage, I mean, you cannot do anything. You can't force the person. Helping somebody should not be by force. So if the person really, after all you have done, the person understands clearly what you want to do, but the person says, no, I'm not interested, or I will not change, I will not be lifted, there is very little you can do. To you know, So you, at that stage, you have to move on. You have to move on. There are others who need help and who accept your help. So go look for those people and help them. And then money over success. It's a, it's a, it's a, a sad reality of our part of the world and our world today, especially in Ghana, where people choose money over principles. But it's always important that you realize that principles last. Money does not last. Money is free. You see, the word money, it's called currency. You know, currency. Currency means something that flows. Okay? Like a river. You see, the river current or electricity current. It's something that is flowing, that is moving. And that's how money is called currency. It flows. It's not stagnant. It flows. And it will go away. It doesn't last forever. But a good name and principles last. And that is why, as a leader, you must always strive to be a person of principle. You have to be a person of principle. Because many people have wondered why is my work not flourishing? It's because we place money over principles. You know, somebody brings money to pay children's school fees and then you squander the money. Well, nobody will bring you more money. They wonder why are people not helping? Because you're not a person of integrity. You know, so let us abide by principles and that will help us to grow. Donors test the waters before they give big money. Before anybody will give you 
$20,000, the words give you $2,000. And check and see how you use the $2,000. And if you've been honest with the $2,000, that person will give you $10,000. And if you're honest, the next time you will see $50,000 coming your way. But if you get $2,000 and you are supposed to use it to buy food for children, or you use it to, to do a program, and you don't do it, you will never get your 50000 And so money is not everything. Money is transient. It will pass. The principles are back. Let us stay with principles. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fred. Thank you so much. Um, all right, a few more, and then we wrap up. Thank you very much. Uh, that is Anna Jr. Whatever you do for me without me, you do against me. That is uh, Mahat Gandhi. A consultation is very important, uh, important in lifting less privileged children up in society. So that's the comment. Francis Agonio say, fantastic presentation. God bless you. Um, George Nicholas SL says, visionary leadership, always seeing my dear sister love Amisa sign for the country's president tells me your vision flag is indeed shining. I'm really learning. All right. So um, looks like uh, one of your converts there, Amisa, interpreting for the president. Thank you for Fred. Um, Periophory, do the people, do the people you are lifting up also have a role in your own upliftment? So that's a question for you. Uh, the people you are lifting up, do they have a role in your own upliftment? Dita Edu say, thanks very much, Mr. Sari, a very practical and relatable delivery. And uh, um, somebody is asking us a sign language expert, why didn't you bring a sign language person to interpret your lectures? Uh, Great presentation, We're hoping to impact it to others. Um, so, um, Fred, um, answer those questions and uh, uh, briefly, but I want uh, everybody to just uh, uh, hold on for two minutes, go on. All right, um, thank you very much. So consultation is very important. Yes, I agree. And that's why I said that you have to listen to your stakeholders. So the fact that you are helping somebody, doesn't mean that you don't listen to the person. So I agree with the, the, the person. Consultation is important. If you are going to feed people on the streets, you need to listen to them and know the kind of food they'll eat. Otherwise, you cook the food and nobody will eat it. So the fact that even doctors, when you go to the hospital, they listen to the patient before they have the patient from sickness. You know, even when the patient is down and cannot speak, the doctor will ask the relatives, what happened? Tell me more. Fish for information. So, if doctors don't just get up and give prescriptions, say, I was going to medical school, you didn't go with me. So, here's great thing. No, listen to patients. And every leader must learn to listen, must consult, especially the people you are trying to lift up. Do the people you are lifting up have a role in your own appointment? Um, I would say, if you are fortunate for them to help lift you up, that is great. But don't bank on it. You know, don't don't put your hopes on it. You develop yourself, and you be responsible for your own growth and development, and be responsible for the development of the other people as well. Every leader must make it a point to help his team grow. When before live to lead, when live to lead started, the very first live to lead. It wasn't organized in Ghana. It was organized, uh, the nearest country where it was organized was Togo, Lome in Togo. I drove the leadership team of Village of Folk all the way to Togo. We crossed the Aflao border way to Togo just to attend Lead to Lead because we wanted everybody at the Village of to grow. We did that for two years before Live to Lead came to Ghana. And Village of Hope has never missed on Live to Lead. Why? Because we want to grow everybody. And a leader must make sure that he develops or she develops his or her team. 
And if you develop them well, you will get the benefits. They will support you. They will lighten your burden for you. So there are benefits when you develop others. When you lift people up, they will also lift you up, for sure. I mean, right now, if I'm sick and, and I go to a uh, confidential hospital, I think I'll get VIP treatment, you know, because my child is a doctor there, it's a senior doctor there. You know, so after the, lifting him up, he's a doctor, now he can also take care of me. So there are benefits. There are benefits that, that come out of that. And we should seek to lift people up and the benefits will fall later on. Thank you very much, Fred. Um, before Fred gives his closing remarks, uh, let me inform all of you who are uh, on the call um, that um, we are getting to the end of the year and the Center for Transformational Leadership is preparing a very, very uh, interesting, useful lessons for you. Very soon, we are all going to set goals. Those of you who are working with organizations, you are setting um, your you are setting your goals, your objectives, and so on. And we are preparing lessons on how to put your dream to the test, how to achieve your goals very, very soon. So we are going to present those uh, programs. It's going to be uh, masterclass is going to be online because of COVID. We don't know the situation. So get ready for put your dream to the test in January. Uh, we would send you the announcements very, very soon. So in January, we'll be doing masterclass and we want you to register ahead of time. Um, it's going to be um, in January and we'll do it for maybe two weeks so you can have options on which days to join it will give you tools to be able to achieve your goals during the year all right so we want to thank you fred there are so many uh, other messages thanking you and uh, appreciating uh, the comments but our time is up running out so i want you to give your closing uh, remarks and uh, on that note, we want to thank everybody who has participated. So Fred, if you're still with us, your last words on how to lift that is. Thank, thank you very much. This world is filled with many hurting people. This world is filled with tens and thousands of hurting people, downtrodden people, People who live on the margins of society. People who have been abandoned, forsaken, neglected, and abused. They are everywhere, in every country, in every city, in every village, in every community. They are who you are. Please, look around you. If you cannot find somebody that you are higher than, it means you haven't looked around you. If you look around you, you will see somebody down there that you can lift up and make an effort to lift somebody up. Make an effort to make a difference in somebody's life. The best use of life is to spend it on something and on someone who will outlive outlive you. So let's use our lives to transform others. Let's use our lives to lift people up. They are everywhere. If you search, you will find them and lift them up. Many times we are not able to lift others up because we lack the confidence. We are not able to lift people up because we feel threatened. We feel inadequate. That is why I've said over and over again, develop yourself. You need to develop your leadership skills. You need to improve upon yourself. Buy books. Attend leadership seminars and conferences and workshops. You know, what ETL Africa doing is fantastic. Contact them. Ask them what they can do to help you improve yourself. It's important that you improve yourself, you develop yourself. Then you will have the confidence to develop others. If you are not growing up, you are going down. The moment you stop to grow, you begin to die. There is no stagnant position in life. Either you are growing or you are dying. 
So when you grow up to a certain age, medical doctors will even tell you that uh, some of your body organs stop growing, you know, systems, and then your cells start to die. So please, if you are not growing, you are dying. So it is with leadership. Develop yourself. Improve yourself continually. Never stop improving yourself and developing yourself. And CTL Africa is there to help you. So take advantage of their training sessions and improve and develop yourself. Having done that, now you'll be in the position if you have a responsibility to look around you and to lift others up. That is a man. We are not here for ourselves. We are here to lift others up. Let's do that. Let's spend our lives making the world a better place by lifting others up. Thank you. Very Thank much. you very much. Let's live our lives, make the world a better place by lifting others up. Somebody is asking if we have certificates for the master class. Yes, you would have certificates for the master class. So it's uh, eight thirty, and we appreciate your time. We want to thank all of you for joining the leadership platform. Next week, we're going to move into an interesting topic. Is going to be on how to lead today's young people. We we'll talk about young people today being fast, they want money, they don't want that, and with the Kadon lesson, and today's youth are this and that. How can we lead the youth of today so that we can lift them up and make them better? Next week, we will have a very, very useful lesson by a very well qualified person. We would announce that during the week. So keep keep faith with us, stay with us, and may the Lord God bless you and keep you as you continue with the platform and as you lift people up. Thank you very much, Fred, for your very insightful lessons and sharing your experience with us. God richly bless everybody and have a good night. There is a popular saying in leadership that if you think you are leading and there is nobody following you, you are only going on a walk. On this platform, you are going to learn principles of leadership. You are going to encounter different leaders. You are going to learn about how you can grow as a leader, how you can make an impact. My name is Samuel Ayim and I'm the host for the leadership platform. I am a leadership coach, a lawyer by profession, a John C. Maxwell certified coach. I have been in corporate life in senior positions for several years, and now I run the Center for Transformational Leadership where we train and coach leaders to become better leaders. And I invite you to go on a journey with us as we discuss the subject of leadership in the coming weeks. This and every Saturday, you have opportunity to ask questions, share your views on important leadership matters.